Um, continuing on where we left off yesterday, just a few slides about multiple transition states. Uh, the basic point of this is life is generally more complicated than, than what you've been led to believe in any kind of, 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 of simple class you received. Almost every reaction has multiple transition states in, in, involved in it. Even simple additions have multiple transition states. Simple abstractions have multiple transition states. So I want to take you through some, a simple model that, 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 that treats that. It turns out that really these concepts are, are, are not so important for combustion temperatures, but for understanding and correlating room temperature data with your calculations and not making fake revisions to your model to reproduce it, it's important to understand these sorts of things. And, and, it, and it, for me, it's a fun theoretical thing that, that, that we can treat these ideas and, and, and get somewhere. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then there's something else, a similar sort of thing, roaming radical reactions. And if you think about uh, uh, molecules that come to, to sort of together, but not all the way together, so they're at a van der Waals separation, van der Waals separation, sort of three angstroms between the, the, the two things that are reacting. You can have all sorts of interesting dynamics going on there and, and, and give you reactions that you might never have thought about. And we've done a lot of work on trying to help understand that. And then I'll just give a, a, a brief uh, description of, of the fact that sometimes you want to use dynamical simulations, and they make a good complement to transition state theory for some cases. So first, just a, a, a sort of bold ref refutation of the literature, the I, IUPAC. Does anybody here know what IUPAC is? All right, so there's somebody that knows something about chemistry. IUPAC is, 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 a, is, a is, a, is, a, is the organization that sets standard definitions in chemistry. It's the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. All right, so they are the ones that are supposed to define things for us. So they've defined for us what an elementary reaction is. It turns out that definition precludes all reactions, if you really follow it to the T. And that, that, that definition says an elementary reaction is assumed to occur in a single step and to pass through a single transition state. Essentially, no reaction occurs through a single transition state. And so there is no such thing as an elementary reaction according to the chemistry standard definition. So I'll give you some idea of that. Let's look at, at, at some, some samples. This, this is what a classical, typical reaction MEP looks like. You start, and this is large separations. You have some kind of long range attraction. Um, there's these dispersion forces. There's all sorts of forces. There might be uh, dipole, dipole. If you have an ion, it's an ion dipole uh, as, as your longest range of interactions. And those interactions all have some, some orientation for which they're attractive. And so you'll have some kind of formation of a long range well. To go beyond that long range well, you then have to do some reorientation usually. Your, your optimum forces, your optimum orientation for your long range interaction are completely different from the optimum orientation you want for chemical interaction. And so you come in on these long range forces, get this van der Waals well that corresponds to the long range minimum, then you do some kind of reorientation before you can start doing real chemistry. Real chemistry is bond formation and, and, and breaking here. So you, if it's an addition, you just start forming that bond if it's, if it's but in forming the bond, you often have to break some other bond. A anyway, so you, so you go through some chemistry, and then you have a saddle point, and then you go way down in energy. This, this sort of energy of Van der Waals, well, a few kcals is sort of typical. And this, this barrier can be, can be way high up in energy, and that's the reason, and, and that's the sort of standard thing. And that's why people talk about there only being a single transition state when it's very high in energy. You don't really care what's going on in here, although there really is a transition state there. You don't, it doesn't really affect the kinetics. But if it's low down here, if it's actually below the asymptotic energy, we call it a submerged barrier. If there's a submerged barrier, then at, at, at zero Kelvin, at the, low, at the limit of zero temperature, this transition state that corresponds to forming the, the Van der Waals complex will be the dominant transition state because you've got some states here that are already at, at your zero energy, at your and when you go out far enough, you'll have no states for this transition state. So you have to, so you have, to have some kind of variational treatment of this one to treat the low temperature ring. And then at high temperatures, you, you see I've, I've shown our vibrational levels with a much wider spacing than I do out here. And so then when you count states and you go up to some energy here, by the time you get to this sort of energy, well, you've got like six states, whereas over here you have maybe 10 or so. So, so you've got a smaller number of states here, a smaller partition <coughs> function in here. 
And so in general, any kind of, of, of addition, abstraction, reaction, you, you have this two transition state picture and you, and you have to account for, for both of those. I like to call the, the one that was enclosed the inner transition state, and that's primarily uh, an entropic bottleneck. We tr can treat that one, it's pretty tight, so rigid rotor, rotor harmonic oscillator is not a bad description. It's corresponding to where we have chemistry, covalent bonds are being formed. The outer transition state, we developed this particular analytic theory that, that can describe that quite well. More, more generally, the, the variable reaction coordinate transition state theory that I talked about yesterday can be used to, to describe the rate of formation of the van der Waals complex very well. You have two transition states. Something acts in series. Wh what happens? You have to have an effective number of states. It's like in circuits, right? You have to, you have to take the sums of the inverses and then one over that is, is, the, is the effective bottleneck to your flux. If you think about this, this, this bottleneck, this effective transition state number of states goes from being the n inner value when n inner is much lower to being n outer value when n outer value is much lower. So it's basically just equivalent, roughly equivalent to taking the minimum of the two bottlenecks and thinking of that as your overall bottleneck to adding things. This is a couple of samples I want to go through. This is eth ethane plus cyanogen in a simple abstraction reaction. We've got the cyanogen coming in and attacking this H atom. This is the geometry of the saddle point uh, on your potential surface. One of the things that you can see here in this plot, I've plotted the electronic energy as well as the zero point energy and the sum of the electronic and the zero point energy. This plot emphasizes that the position of the saddle point on the electronic surface is not the same as the position of the saddle point on the sum of the electronic and the zero point energy. The one on the electronic plus zero point energy is actually of much more relevance to the kinetics. That's the, that's the, the, the key bottleneck is where the maximum in that is. So you see here, uh, our electronic saddle point is out here and is actually positive. The zero point energy is decreasing. That, that's kind of a little bit unusual. Usually when you bring things together, their, their zero point is, is going up. But instead, in this case, the zero point energy is going down because what's happening is, as, as the CN comes, to, comes in, this CH bond is, strength, is stretching. As you stretch this bond, its frequency goes down. That frequency is very high. And so if it's going down by some percentage, it turns out to be a big absolute change. And so you get a big uh, negative change in the zero point energy. And not only this stretching frequency, but also the, the CH bending frequency. And so we have a, a zero point energy that's going down and combining with the, a saddle point on the electronic and you get some kind of saddle point on the sum surface at a slightly different position, but a very different energy. It's at a negative energy. So our zero point plus electronic potential in this case is it submerged and we're going to have this transition from long range to short range behavior. This is a plot of our calculated rate constant for this particular reaction in comparison with experiment. A type of experiment called the Cressu apparatus developed by Sims and Smith uh, allows them to actually measure rate constants down to about 20 Kelvin for, for, for a, a wide range of, of reactions. That set of data provides interesting tests for theoretical predictions because in that region we're getting close to this zero Kelvin range where we're really determined by the, the low temp, by the outer transition state. So this blue line is what I would get for my predictions if I just considered the inner transition state. That works very well here at high temperature. The green line is what I get if I just consider the long range transition state. Ultimately, the one where we consider both of them converges to this long range transition state, but you have to get to very low temperatures before they, before they converge. In this region where the new experiments were, being, were, were found, were, were, were performed, uh, we get very nice agreement for this effective number of states that, that takes these two treatments. I'm not adjusting any parameters in that plot. Those are the, the, the real predictions. Another case, that was for an abstraction. This is for, for an addition, and I want to go through this because this gives you uh, some more complications. One of the things you find when you do ab initial kinetics is you, everything looks easy when you start, but you'll always find some complication that, 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 that requires you to understand just a little bit more of something. 
you can always do things at a, at a, at a, at a less accurate level, but, but if you really want to understand things, you've you got to dig in a little more deeper. And this, this is an illustration of that. Oxygen triplet P atom is our problem, is the thing that gives us complications in this case. Uh, triplet P, ox, oxygen atoms, there's four electrons in the P orbitals. There's three P orbitals. So you have X, Y, and Z directions for your P orbitals. In one direction, you're going to put two electrons, and the other two directions, you're going to put one electron. Now you want to have this come in and bind to your pi system of, of, of different alkenes. And the way that happens is you align one of your singly occupied orbitals in the direction of that pi orbital of, of your alkene. And you can do that that way or that way, but if you do it this way, you're already doubly occupied and it doesn't want to do it. And so what you find is that at infinite separation, you effectively have three separate degenerate triplet states. They're each triplet states because you've got two unpaired electrons and, the, and there's just three different orientations for that combination of two unpaired electrons. So you get three times three, you get a degeneracy of nine in your electronic states at first order. Now we bring this in and we find that two of these triplet states are attractive and one is repulsive. And so we end up with an electronic degeneracy of basically six. Well, that's complicated enough, but that's actually only the first approximation. We have to deal with something else. When you have a, a radical and an electron, and there's a degeneracy for that radical, you have what's called spin orbit splitting. The spin of the electron couples with the orbital angular momentum. And so these three triplets of oxygen atom actually exist as a qu quintet, a triplet, and a singlet. Five plus three plus one is nine. That's the same as my three times three that I started with. So I've got three separate, and properly I've got three separate electronic states. And I have to think of what happens to those. That's trying to show you what happens is a little bit complicated. You have to go through. Uh, so spin orbit interactions are relativistic and it, it gets to be complicated. Let's just leave it at that. But you can actually calculate them with your electronic structure codes. But by the time you get to your transition state, these spin orbit splittings have sort of disappeared. They start to, you, you, you've come together and you, you're interacting enough with other things in your system that, that basically spin orbit splitting becomes irrelevant. And you come back to this picture I said of two separate attractive surfaces and one repulsive. So we've got here one triplet. We put an X. X in chemistry means ground state. I don't know where that idea came from, but X is ground state. And then A is the first one above the ground state. And then we've got another, basically, triplet up here. This is our repulsive triplet and our two separate attractive triplets. You have to take account of all these degeneracies carefully to try and properly calculate the rate constant. This is, is now a, a more quantitative version of this for our two attractive states. We don't really care about the repulsive. We're not going to count that in our states because it's just going to have zero contribution to our rate. The solid curves are the ground states. Uh, red is for butane and, and, and blue is for, for ethylene. And then the dashed is for uh, the first excited states, again, for ethylene and, and butene. We see that for butene, we're slightly submerged. And for ethylene, we're slightly above the threshold. This is a common thing when you think about long-range potentials and, 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 and barrier heights. Bigger systems have bigger long-range interactions. The dispersion interaction is proportional to the size of the molecule, in essence. If you have an H atom, there's almost no dispersion. By the time you get to butene, your dispersion is getting to be quite significant. And you're just looking at this here. The difference between these two is, I see we're doing in kilojoules. So, Sometimes I collaborate with Europeans and then they like kilojoules. If I work with Americans, we like kcals. You, uh, there's another distinction here. Chemists will always plot them in molecular units. Engineers will almost always plot rates in uh, Avogadro's number times that. And just to make life confusing, of course, Avogadro's number times 10 to the minus 11 is basically 10 to the 11th. And so the typical number in molecular units is the same thing as a typical number in molecular units, just without the sign there. 
And so if you're not reading carefully, you can readily get confused. That has certainly happened to me at times. Um, so back to this. So, we, so we've got some, this difference is different to, due to dispersion. So the experimentalist looked at a whole series of these. And what happens then is as you bring this level of submersion down, you get a more and more rapid conversion, a more and more relevance to the long range transition state. The deeper this is down, the further down this is, the more you're going to be dominated by the long range behavior. So we were able to make predictions for this whole series of, 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 of things in, in comparison with experiment and, and, and accurately reproduce their, their data. I think we had one parameter, which was the, some kind of reference starting saddle point energy. And we can use the same sort of shift for all of them. And it was like a tenth of a kcal or something, nothing very significant. But what you see is this transition from at propene it's barely able to react. Ethylene, it doesn't even, it doesn't even uh, react at low temperature because we have this positive barrier. And then as we go up to larger size systems, it gets to be more and more reactive at, at low temperature. And if you tried to extrapolate experimental data at room temperature, which is what people, would, we, this was a, we were trying to do things of relevance to uh, chemistry on Titan's atmosphere, where the temperature is around 100 Kelvin. And they're trying to make extrapolations. But if they have only data near room temperature, you would extrapolate something like this down to, to being some very small number. But in reality, if you take account for things properly, it comes back up. And so it makes a big difference in people's models. Yes? Why, why, OK, so I, I think his question is, why are, why are the error bars larger here than they are up here? And the, the, the basic thing is an experimentalist, they're, they're, not, they're not larger for our calculation. In a, uh, I should be careful. But it, let's go to what I do know. Experimentally, it's hard to measure rates that are small. Okay, And so the smaller the rate, the bigger the error bar they end up with. All right, so by the, time they, by the time they get to ethylene, they just know that the number is less than that. And here at propene, they're just at the, at the border of what they can or can't see in their apparatus. And, and by the time they get up here, these are nice large numbers, and they're able to get really small error bars. So if you want to think about how the, how the, how the theoretical uncertainty varies with system, well, it's basically a, a Boltzmann factor in your energy. And, and, you, and the uncertainty in the energy doesn't really matter what the system is. It's, it's probably, say, two or three tenths of a kcal. I don't know exactly what level I did these at. Maybe it's a half a kcal. You can look at a Boltzmann factor in half a kcal. But it's not quite as simple as that. It's a Boltzmann factor in, in half a kcal where the tight transition state dominates. What we really have is mostly over this region, the, the, the outer transition state dominating. And then it's a, then it's a different sort of thing. And then it's more like 10 or 20 percent, sort of regardless of what system we're looking at. And, but depending a little bit on how much, how hard I worked at getting the basis set limit and so on. Uh, it would be an, an, an interesting exercise in uncertainty analysis to, 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 to apply uncertainties to, to the barrier height and the, to the inner transition state part and the outer transition state part and see how that maps into, into overall uncertainty. That's one of the things that theoreticians never do, but we should, we, as, as we try, as you look at being useful to modelers, understanding what the accuracies are is pretty important. And it wouldn't be very hard to, to, to be apply, doing that sort of thing and, and making realistic estimates of uncertainties. All right. I said at the beginning that, there's, that, that, that there, there can be dynamics in this long range region. You come together. And after you come together, you can have some kind of reorientation. That, that reorientation might lead to, to different kinds of, of, of bonding. Um, this gives us a particular example here. And we've got an HCO fragment. And I, I actually don't know whether this plot is for methyl or for H interacting with HCO. The plots look almost identical, and I don't have a reference as to which one it is. The, 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 for ease of understanding, for your ease of understanding, let's pretend this is H. But then, then when I show the actual dynamics picture, it's going to be for methyl. But let's, let's, let's think for a moment about H interacting with HCO. We, the, the, remember, blue lines are contours for attraction. And they, we're getting increasingly attractive as we bring an H atom in along a vector like this. Same thing, if we bring an H atom in along a vector like this, we get increasingly attractive. When we come in this way, we're going to form formaldehyde. 
If we come in this way, we're going to come in and abstract this H and make H2 plus CO. Everywhere it's red, it's repulsive. We don't want to go there. Now let's think about the dissociation of formaldehyde. We start with a, an H that's going to come off from here. And these H's aren't going in straight lines. They're wiggling around all over the place, and, and so also is the HCO, but I'm not going to worry about that too much for the moment. So, that, so it's moving around here, and, and, and it eventually gets out far enough that it, that it says, oh, I can, I can actually go all the way over here. I don't have to just sort of bounce back and forth in my local bending motion. I can, if I get out here, I can actually come over around here. There's a bit of a saddle point here. I can come over this saddle point and come over here. And now once I'm over here, oh, there's, a, there's an attraction over here. I can come in and start doing this attraction, and I can go in and abstract this H2 motion. Dynamicists have called this particular motion, set of motions I described, roaming. You have a partial bond association. You break this CH bond enough that this H is basically able to move around freely, roam around freely. That's why they call it roaming. And after it roams, it then has new choices available to it. And here the choice is making H2 and CO. How do we calculate rates for things like that? We can try and set up transition state theory and, and, and do some fancy transition state approximation. That, doesn't, that works sort of pretty well, but it's more interesting to think about doing this with dynamics. All right, let's think what we can do. Up, up, up to the point of getting the H from a certain distance away from this, from this HCO, we're just doing ordinary statistical things. So we could, we could have a dividing surface here that tells us the rate for breaking the bond partially, bringing it out far enough that it, that, it, that, it, that it sort of passed its transition state, passed its inner transition state. And then we could imagine just propagating trajectories from there. Now we have just a, a limited motion. We'll, we'll think about the HCO as a rigid body, just like we did in variable reaction coordinate transition state theory, and just propagate the H motion relative to this rigid body. And then we can figure out, does the H want to keep on going out here? Does it want to come around? and abstract, and if once it's done the abstraction, then we're, we don't need to do trajectories. This is a picture of the methyl case. This is, this is the MEP for that roaming reaction. So you see, it, it first breaks that CC bond, the, the methyl group rotates around, comes in, and attacks that H. Okay. So this is simply an MEP calculation. You, you go back here. We, have a saddle point here. That this, is, this is a saddle point on a potential energy service here. We start an IRC calculation forwards and backwards, and then we put that together and make a movie. And that's, that's what I'm showing you here, just that simple IRC calculation. You can do that for lots of things. We, we put together dynamics calculations, and we can, we can predict and, 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 and estimate roaming. This kind of thing happens all, 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 all over the place. It happens essentially every reaction that you have a bond fission. I'll get to you in just a second. Uh, uh, it, it, can, it, it can happen all over the place. It, anytime you have a bond fission, if you've got a, a radical left that's not, uh, not something like methyl, that, that, that has any degree of, of well, that, well, that can be abstracted from, then your thing will come in and abstract. Okay? So, so if you have propane and you have a methyl come off, it can come in and abstract an H from the, from the ethyl and make methane plus ethylene. Ethane is like one of the few cases where, where it can't do anything because you get two methyls and you, methyl doesn't like to lose another H. And so you're kind of stuck. But any sort of ordinary radical that is weakly bound will lose another H and, and do this process. I'm sorry. Okay, a question in the back. Yeah. Okay. So his question is, so now we've got this reaction. How do I calculate the rate for it? That's actually a very good question. Uh, the, the, I, I didn't prepare slides for that. I, I should have. I could have. Uh, there, there's two ways we can do that. 
we can, as you were trying to describe, set up transition state theory models. Okay, and so what, what we would do, we would set up a, a, a inner transition state here, so we calculate the rate to go from our reactant to the van der Waals region. Then we set up a transition state to go from one side to the other side. And then we set up a transition state to go from this side in to do the abstraction. And then we set up a, another transition state that is telling us what it takes to break that van der Waals complex into two separated fragments. What we have in the picture I just described are effectively two long-range intermediates. We treat those intermediates in kinetic steady state, and you can derive then simple expressions for the rate constants to go out to each of your separate species. And, and you put in transition state expressions for each of those things. That works pretty well, but it misses some, some key feature. And, and the key feature it misses is if I'm starting to go out, if, you know, for me to break this bond, I have to have had some kind of motion in this, pot, in this direction where I'm increasing the CH bond. There is some dynamical preference to keep doing that rather than, than, than do this sampling over to the other side. And so your statistical theory overestimates the rate of, of this roaming part of the process. It's a factor of two sort of overestimate at high energies. At low energies, it actually underestimates because then we have a different dynamical preference. If we don't really have very much energy, if we're just barely enough energy to go out to infinite separation, then we're probably going to be doing a lot of bouncing around in here. And so then you're more likely to have figured out that you go over here than you are to keep going on. And there's some kind of dynamical preference to go roaming. So at low energies, you underestimate the roaming, and at high energies, you slightly overestimate the roaming. So that's the statistical approach to doing it. You can, what I, you can also just simply run trajectories. You start trajectories at this inner transition state. That gives you a rate to get out here. Once you calculate this rate, then what you need to have is a branching fraction of things that got here. You can say, OK, do they go out, do they go over, or do they come back? You can, use a, you can start a bunch of trajectories here, and a statistical ensemble of trajectories, and calculate those branching ratios. And we've done that. And that works. That should be accurate within the limitations of, of classical mechanics. Classical mechanics should be very good, because these are low frequency motions that we're dealing with here. So we, we consider that to be a very useful way to think about things. The central feature in what, what I'm talking about there is what we call reduced dimensional dynamics. We're thinking about our two fragments as rigid fragments. We're not thinking about the internal motions of, of each of them. We assume those are separated out and we don't really, really care about them. In, in, in any kind of rate calculation, they would just contribute the same to both the transition state and the reactants. And so it's this conserved transitional mode separation that we talked about in variable reaction coordinate transition state theory. The nice thing about this, what I mentioned yesterday, if, if, if we look at our potential surface, yeah, it gets complicated up to 6D, but 6D is a lot better than, than the dimension uh, of, of the whole potential surface of methyl HCO. If we think about four, five, six, seven atoms, there's three times the number of atoms minus six degrees of freedom on a potential. You take away three for rotation, take away three for translation. So three n minus six, so there's 15 degrees of freedom for, for the potential service for motion on this. It's a lot easier to develop a good potential service for six dimensions than it is for 15 dimensions. So that's one, one use for dynamics, looking at, at things like roaming reactions and trying to understand them quantitatively. Another use is for very exothermic reactions. A lot of reactions in combustion are very exothermic. Radical oxidation reactions of unsaturated species are almost always really exothermic. And that's true uh, for, for O2 adding to things. If you add O atom to something, it's really exothermic. If, you're, if you like plasma chemistry. Maybe you're thinking about O-singlet-D reactions. Well, O-singlet-D is so high in energy that everything is very exothermic. And there, there's, there's two problems that, that, that come from that. And I'm showing here a potential service for vinyl plus O2 coming from the Goldsmith calculator when he was a postdoc with me. Um, 
And what happens is you start here and you go over a few saddle points. The, the main paths here are, are shown in, in bold black. You start here and everything's fine, it's ordinary transition state. But then you get way down here and you've got a hundred and some kcals in this well. If you think about the rates of the processes when you have 100, K, 100 plus kcals, they start to become too fast for statistical mechanics to really be appropriate. Statistical mechanics assume that you sample, sample all degrees of freedom according to just the, their, their, their phase space volume. But that's unlikely to be true. Qualitatively, from lots of dynamical studies, you learn that it, that, that it takes about a picosecond to, to spread energy within a molecule. Maybe a nanosecond, maybe a femtosecond, but picosecond is, is the number I like, and, but there's some variation. So if your rates are greater than a picosecond from transition state theory, there is some dubious nature to, their, to them. They're, they're not the same kind of accuracy as if they're smaller numbers. If you have very high excess energies, they become somewhat <laughs> doubtful. They become so fast. All right. I, don't, I didn't actually look at this particular system. This may be true. It certainly is true in the methyl plus oxygen system that you start to get to be that case. The smaller your system, the faster these rates will be as well. Okay? So you have to start to think. Of, and then it's interesting to do dynamical simulation. So what, what could you do? You could start a bunch of trajectories at, at this saddle point. Okay. And then you can propagate forward. And now we're doing classical mechanics. Well, we don't really like classical mechanics, but it's all right. Because we've got so much energy, classical mechanics start, it starts to be good again. And all we're going to try and do is figure out the branching. We're not trying to, th this isn't having any effect on the rate. All these processes simply go forwards. They don't come back, and they do so rapidly. So the, 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 the rate limiting steps are up here, where we're still doing good transition state theory with quantum treatments, and we can propagate dynamics. Franklin is, is, is doing that sort of calculation, I believe. A second thing that happens is look at our products. Our products here, HCO and, and formaldehyde, these are our primary products. We've got 80 kcals or so available to those. Does anybody know what the bond energy of HCO is? It's about 15 to 20 kcals depending on whether you count over the barrier or zero point and so on, but 15 to 20 kcals. Now we've got 80 kcals. Not all that 80 kcals goes into HCO. Some of it goes into formaldehyde, some of it goes into HCO, some of it goes into translation. But if you've got 80 kcals and you distribute it statistically, there's a pretty good probability that you're going to have more than 15 or 20 kcals in HCO. So it's wrong, in some level, to think of this as forming HCO. Instead, you're going to form H plus CO and formaldehyde in a lot of cases. We would like to know what that fraction is. Transition state theory doesn't tell you how you distribute energy here. Right? You, you go up here to this saddle point, and there's some kind of energy distribution. But it tells you nothing about whether it's going to all go into HCO, it's going to all go into formaldehyde. It's going to go, just doesn't tell you. Transition state theory is to tell you rates of the, the of the process at the, that. But that, this, this determination of energy happens after that transition. We can't tell from transition. So uh, an easy thing to do, just to take this saddle point, start a whole bunch of trajectories here, and propagate them forward. You've got a huge amount of energy. This is going to happen very quickly. You can do direct dynamics. You can, you can just simply call an electronic structure code and propagate forward in time, and, and it's just a simple uh, call. It's something that you can readily do with Gaussian, for example. And then look at your products and look and see where your energy ended up. We, we and, and Franklin is doing as well, some did some preliminary sorts of things, and, and you can see here is our distribution of energy that you get into this HCO. This is the probability that the HCO energy Greater than E. I don't know. Oh, it's greater than a particular energy. Well, to, to dissociate, it has to be above, above 20. And so you've got a, 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 a significant fraction of it that's above that energy, maybe 50%. And as you increase your starting energy, it goes up a little bit. So maybe half of the HCO will dissociate. We did a similar kind of thing on, on HCCO plus O2. Here, we've, we've, we're going through 
uh, some tight transition states, and then we go way down. I don't have the energy down, but we're de again down around 100 and some kcals, and so we run direct dynamics. So, so, so direct dynamics, dynamics is a useful thing for thinking about highly exothermic reactions, what happens in the branching. Highly exothermic helps you in lots of ways. It's the tr it's classical mechanics is better, less sensitivity to potential, so you can use qualitative things like DFT. Okay. I'm going to move on to the start of today's lectures. Maybe before I do that, does anybody want to ask any questions about, about what we just went through? So let's start talking about pressure dependence. And we're going to, again, start with formalism and try and build our way up from simple formalism to realistic formalism, to formalism for more complex things. The simple formalism is for reactions where you have a single well. Imagine having H and CO and adding H to CO, or having H and O2 that's, and adding H to O2, that's making HO2. Then that's a simple single well reaction. You come together and you go back. Nothing else can happen. You just come together and go back. All right. That's what we want to start with. I'm going to talk about that and the standard treatments for that. And then we'll go on to 2D master equation, which is a sort of a, a new advance we, we've been working on. And then it, we'll go on to the more complex things, multiple wells, multiple channels. And then if time permits, we'll talk some about non-thermal effects, basically failures of, of the standard formalism. So let's start with single well, single channel reactions. Work our way up from Hinch, Lindemann and Hinshelwood, and, and then RKM theory. RKM theory is named after my old advisor, Rudy Marcus. Rice, Ramberger, Ramsberger, Castle, Marcus. And then you can add a modified strong collider to try and sort of make an ad hoc fix to that. None of these are really right. To treat things properly, you need to go to the master equation, with, and I'll describe to you what the master equation is, but, but basi basically it's just solving for the populations of your species in, on a grid of energies. Rather than just the, the total population of your species, you think about the population of species at each energy that it could have. And then, as I said, 2D master, we can talk about energy transfer and entropy. This book that I mentioned before that, that I use for our dynamical derivation also does a nice job of talking about pressure dependence. Other books like one by Pillinger also give pretty nice descriptions. So let's think about the physical picture. Even if you're not going to understand the mathematics, it's useful to start by, by, by understanding what it is we're trying to describe. So imagine we have a methane molecule. And it's sitting in some bath gas, some helium bath gas is, is the what we've drawn here. So we, we start maybe down here at the bottom of the well. And the methane has a collision with a helium, and it gets excited up a little bit. It goes up to this energy. And then it has another collision, and it goes up. And then another collision maybe comes down a little bit. And it just starts going up and down, up and down. And every once in a while, every once in a while, one of these molecules will happen to get above the dissociation threshold. Once it gets above the dissociation threshold, it has a new option available to it. Now, instead of just vibrating around, it can kick off 1H and have H and methyl. And so the whole dissociation process is some kind of competition between this going up and down in energy and this dissociation process. If it goes up and it has another collision and brings it down before it has a chance to figure out it could dissociate, then you haven't dissociated yet. You haven't let that happen. And so, you, so, so there's a real competition between those two processes. The rate is a complex function of those two things. It's good to think about two separate limits. In the low pressure limit, well, let, let's think about the high pressure limit first. In the, in the high pressure limit, you're going up and down here in, in these states very rapidly, much more rapidly than you dissociate. And so what that, what that means is that your distribution of methane molecules is always going to be a Boltzmann distribution. Your, your probability of being at some high energy states is just e to the minus beta e times the density of states of that divided by the partition function. It's just a simple, because you're going, but the collisions establish Boltzmann equilibria. That's how you get Boltzmann popular, that's, that's, that's how you get equilibriums. You have collisions moving you up and down and establishing that equilibrium. And so the high pressure limit, you're saying you have a lot of these collisions, so you just continually repopulate things. And, and that's true even above the dissociation threshold in the high pressure limit. In that case, 
you've got a rate constant that's going to be independent of collisions. It's going to depend just on how fast you dissociate from this distribution. You can just take this distribution and average it over the rate of dissociation for everything that's above that, that, that dissociation energy. So that's the high pressure limit physical picture. Don't care about what your collision rate is. Don't care about because you're, you're, you, don't, you only care about it, the fact that it's so high that it's faster than your dissociation rate. The other limit, the low pressure limit, now we have very few collisions. You go here and then you sit here for a long time. Then you go up here and you sit here for a long time and, and so on. And then when you get one collision that brings you above the dissociation threshold, the low pressure limit, you're imagining that, that the collisions are really, really infrequent. And so if it gets here, it's going to figure out it can dissociate before it has another collision. So in this case, you don't care what the dissociation threshold is, uh, the dissociation rate is, because everything that gets above the dissociation threshold dis that dissociates. So all that matters is how quickly do you excite up to the dissociation threshold. Two opposite limits. Low pressure, all you care about is your collisional excitation rate. High pressure, all you care about is how fast do you dissociate when you get up there, after you've already gotten up there. And that's the kind of, of, of phenomenon we have to reproduce with mathematics. I've got in here angular momentum labeled as well. Because as I said yesterday, between collisions, angular momentum is, a com is an absolute constant of the motion. And so when you try and think more deeply, you don't think just about energy conservation. You don't think just about changing energies. You think also about angular momentum changes. All right, and we'll do a little bit of that later. But to start, I'm just going to ignore the angular momentum for now, all right? It's sort of a second order effect and, and it just complicates your thinking. A question? So, for the case of high pressure uh, limit, um, you're, you're saying that it, re it should reach, it should always basically be at equilibrium, right? Because you're constantly hitting it with, with the bath gas. So, technically, you would, you're expecting statistically that some CH4s at the equilibrium will always be above that dissociation energy and it's only those ones. So then how come the rate of that, the high pressure limit is, uh, is, is higher than the rate of the low pressure limit? Okay, so his question is, we, we said that with the high pressure limit we're, we're maintaining both an equilibrium. And then, so, so, but then why does that correlate with the rate being faster than in the low pressure limit, if I understood him? Okay. So, so in, in the high pressure limit, you've always got these molecules populated up there. You're doing that population process infinitely rapidly. And so you're not limited at all by that. In the low pressure limit, you're having to continually repopulate that. So you've got an extra thing to slow you down. You're, this, this rate of, of bringing you up is part of the slowness of the process. In the high pressure limit, the rate of bringing you up is so fast that it's become irrelevant. And so, you're, so, and so you, 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 you can think of it as there being two bottlenecks. In the high pressure limit, the one bottleneck is so fast that it doesn't matter. Okay? And, and, and in the other case, it's that, that one that was so fast has now become so slow that, it, that it's, it's made the other one that, that, that you still have become faster than it. And so, and so, you, so it's just a question of which bottleneck is, 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 is how the bottlenecks are coming together. We're going we're gonna to see a little bit of that with, with mathematics here as we go on. Okay. So you can, you can think about these things in recombination, dissociation, direction, it doesn't matter, you can, the, the, everything comes out the same. Uh, uh, microscopic reversibility and so on. Uh, I'm going to start with thinking about it from recombination direction. So we have a, a, a reactant A, a reactant B, and we're forming an AB dimer, right? And remember, we're just doing a single recombination process. We can think about a formation rate at a given energy, and then the, the, the overall uh, rate of coming together here is just the Boltzmann average of, of that rate of coming together. But that's not quite the real answer because if we bring these things together, they might just go back as well. So now we've got to think about the rate of them coming back, the dissociation rate of things. And so 
what we have to do to actually form a stabilized complex is we have to take away some of that energy. And so we have to have collisions with bath gases. So we have a collisions of our AB molecule at given energy with some M to go to a different energy and a different M. So there's a collision rate times the probability of different energy transfer. These are the things that come into our physical picture. I talked about it all as exciting a, a, a methane to dissociate it. And now I'm just saying, talking about methyl plus H and coming together. All the same things that are going on. All right, let's think about the simplest model, the lindemann hinshelwood model. In the lindemann hinshelwood model, we assume that every collision leads to stabilization. Every collision with a bath gas, I should say. So we've got this A plus B making AB star. And, and we, we think about all these rates are only temperature dependent. We don't worry about the energy dependence. We're just trying to make our life simple. This is the kind of thing that was around in the early 1900s, if I remember right. And then we've got the dissociation rate. Again, we think of that as only a function of temperature. And we've got a collision rate. Now we just take this simple kinetic model and we apply steady state to our AB star population. We don't really worry about the distribution of energy there, we just apply a steady state to it. Trivial thing, you've all probably done that in some kinetics class. You get an effective rate that's given with this expression. The formation rate times what I like to call the probability of stabilization. The collisional rate, the probability that you'll have a collision uh, and to be stabilized relative to the, to the total rates of things that happen. Okay. So you've got a, a rate of stabilizing versus a rate of everything happening, the sum of dissociation and, and, that, and the, that ratio is, is telling you the probability that you're going to be stabilized by a collision rather than, than re-dissociate. If you take the limit where the concentration M goes to infinity, then this rate constant just goes to the formation rate. If you take the limit where m goes to 0, then this number here becomes less than 1, and so your rate constant becomes less than the formation rate. This is a little bit of an answer to your question from mathematics, right? Okay, so here now, we put in, we put in a non-zero, I mean a non-infinity uh, pressure, and then suddenly we, we multiply by a number that by definition is less than one, and so our, our, our effective rate in the low pressure limit has to be less than it was in the high pressure limit. It's, and it turns out to be just this collision rate divided by the dissociation rate. Yes? But here you're assuming that all the M's collisions are just killing it. Sure. Rather than some of them are need to be exciting. We, you, you can qualitatively correct for that by putting in a factor here, we'll do this in a minute, a, a probability that they're effective. As we, we'll put a beta C parameter here, okay? But that beta C will go into both of these, and so it'll still be, and you're multiplying by a number less than one. Well, you're right. Th that's, that's one of the essential flaws in here, and that was one of the assumptions we made, and we're going to try and go beyond that. To really go beyond that, you have to go to the master equation. Oops. Uh, this is not, this is not, Lindemann theory is not accurate. It, it, it gets the right sort of expression in low pressure and the right sort of expression in high pressure, but it, it misses quite substantially in intermediate pressures. Low pressure you do see, and it's not obvious here, oh, I, I, I have, I have dropped the M dependence, unfortunately, right? There should be a KFC, KC times concentration M. And so you have a pressure dependent low pressure limit and a pressure independent low pr high pressure limit. Sorry. Now let's go a little bit, make it a little bit better. Uh, we don't need to presume that everything is just dependent on temperature. We can worry about the energy dependence. Or we could worry about the energy and angular momentum dependence, but we're gonna just worry about the energy dependence. So we start with the energy dependence for the formation rate. We, we, we then get an effective rate constant uh, uh, for the thermal process is, is a Boltzmann average of the effective rate constant at a given energy. And, and we need to think about what this, what this K effective is for, for, for different things. And the K effective is the, is the formation rate times the probability 
that you're stabilized at a given energy for a given pressure. P of E is just our Boltzmann probability. So this is just a, a, a simple way to put in energies dependence from that same equation that we started with, that same uh, kinetic scheme that we started with. And we're just putting in here then these actual expressions, and the formation rate is n dagger over h rho, the Boltzmann probability is rho e to the minus beta a over the partition functions, and the probability of stabilization is the same as before, but now we put in an energy dependence to our dissociation. Various things cancel, we get a little bit simpler, we can pull out the partition functions. And now we've got, you, you see, this, this is like a partition function for the transition state, and this is the probability of stabilization. We can take high and low pressure limits from this, we let m go to infinity, and we can immediately end up with our standard transition state theory expression. Yeah, we just let m goes to infinity of this expression, this becomes unity, this integral goes to, the, goes to the, a standard definition of q dagger. And so we get standard uh, transition state theory per different. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, sometimes people do, sometimes they don't write x of minus beta e dagger. It's just as a convention whether you're going to define your partition functions relative to one standard or, or to their own separate standard. You can have everything defined relative to an absolute energy, then you don't put the exponential of beta e. You can define your partition functions in separately with the standard being the ground state of the particular thing. So the transition state, if you use your reference, the transition state energy, then you need to put an exponential of minus beta e. And so you'll see people putting, sometimes not putting that exponential beta. It doesn't mean anything fancy, it just means you're, you're including or not including it in your definition of the partition function. Uh, this comes back now to the question you asked, all right. Oh, what about the fact that, that not every collision leads to stabilization? Only a fraction of them do. So you uh, just presume that you, that, that you can multiply your rate of stabilization by some arbitrary number. This arbitrary number is typically about 0.1 to 0 0.01 uh, when you do things by trying to adjust to agree with experiments. You can get nice agreement with experiment with an RQM model for any kind of simple single channel reaction in general. And what you do is you adjust, adjust this beta C. And there is uh, theoretical formulas that try and map proper solutions into these empirical parameters beta C. But where you get into trouble is people then try and take this model and try to apply, apply it to more complex systems where you have multiple channels and multiple wells and there you run into dramatic failures, and no matter what you do, you can't fit the data in many cases. But people try to extend it and use it a lot anyways, just because it's a very simple thing to do. Well, if we do this, then we get the same kind of expressions. But now let's look at the low pressure limit. I think the other side, I looked at the high pressure limit. We look at the low pressure limit, you get to be directly dependent on this uh, empirical parameter that tells you what fraction of collisions are stabilizing. You're also dependent on the density of states of the complex. And this is uh, starting at, at what I labeled here as zero. It starts at the dissociation threshold. So, so I like to think of this as telling me that when I think about dissociation, uh, about dissociation association rates, what matters in the low pressure limit is the density of states at the dissociation threshold. So, and a, a key thing here is you see nothing, nothing that has anything to do with the transition state. Zero dependence on the transition state. All that matters is your, is your parameters of the, at, at the dissociation energy and then your rates of going up and down in energy. So if you're doing a low pressure rate measurement, you can't possibly learn anything about a transition state. People sometimes forget that. But it's also got interesting things. Uh, it's a little further than I thought. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to see how, what ramifications that has in a, in, a, in a little bit. Now let's think about the master equation. Let's think about doing it properly. Well, what do you want to do to treat it properly? The, this idealized system of, of every 
so many collisions being stabilizing is just wrong. It's not what happens. You have a whole bunch of collisions. And it takes a loss of a certain amount of energy that, that in certain, and that happens not in one step, but in multiple steps in general. So you, so you, so, and your populations then are just sort of changing as, as, as they sometimes decide to, so, and there's this competition then between gradual loss or, or, or gain of energy and the dissociation process that, that gradually becomes more rapid as you rise in energy. And you have to really properly model that competition to get the proper rate. So the master equation is designed to try and do that. You write down uh, equations for the population. These N of E's are your populations of your complex on a grid of energy. So here we write it as a continuum expression. When you actually solve it, you turn your continuum expressions into grids and you just solve, it, solve it, things numerically. And it ends up being a linear equation and you can just sign, uh, find the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. And the lowest eigenvalue correlates with the rate constant, the most negative rate constant. So this looks complicated. All we're doing here, though, is just writing down what, what things lead you to, to make transitions. You've got collisions giving you, causing you to go make a change in energy according to the, to, the, to the energy you start, the energy you end. You've got a dissociation process. You can think about this as, as just a dissociation, and then you might set up irreversibly. Or you can think about it as an association, and then you have a reversible thing that includes the formation rate. You can solve things either way, and there's, a, there's like a million different ways to solve them. I like the eigenvalue, eigenvector way. All right, the eigenvalue, eigenvector way, you do some kind of symmetrization. I don't want to take you through the math. We end up with, a, with a, an equation uh, that's, a, that, that's a linear equation here. We diagonalize it, and you can represent your populations in terms of the eigenvectors and your starting, uh, your projections on your starting coefficients, and, and it's all quite straightforward. Now, to, to do that, we have to, to implement that in an ab initio way, we have to be able to calculate the collision rate. It's various simple expressions. You have a hard sphere rate. The one that almost everybody uses is something called the Leonard Jones rate, and that's just the hard sphere rate times this omega 2 2 star, and it's got some sort of well parameterized expression for Leonard Jones things, and you can try and, and figure things out. You need to know the epsilon parameters and. and Looks like it, oh, and the, the sigma comes in here into this hard sphere part. And you can then make crude estimates of, of collision rates. And this is what people basically do. The reason why they use this, it's actually not a very good expression. Almost all molecules have dipole moments. And dipole moments change what the Leonard Jones collision rate. And there are other dispersion, and it's just not really a very good model. But everybody uses it because in the end, you're going to have a free parameter to fit things with. And it's going to be basically the product of this collision rate with that free parameter that determines what your, how your, what your overall rate is. Right? And so you can try and do this well, but all you're going to do is change, change your, your free parameter by 50% or something like that. Typ typically, uh, it seems like this is about a 50% underestimate in, in most cases. Having said that, there is, there is one, uh, this is, as we move to 2D master equations, and we're trying to do this all ab initio now, and not adjust things, then it behooves us to start worrying about this and doing it right. That's a little bit of a complication. We can do that, but it, it adds more difficulty for us. Uh, Within the master equation, we have to have this probability for going up and down. The standard thing is to write things as an exponential in, in, in the energy difference between the two states. And then you have some kind of normalization factor that, that comes about by thinking and making sure that detail balance is set. Detail balance says that the rate to go up has to be equal to the rate to go down uh, with appropriate ratios of densities of states. You have to have detail balance satisfied or you won't get equilibrium populations according to statistical mechanics. And so you have to always be worried about making sure that the things you plug in properly satisfy detailed them. You can do other things like a Gaussian or double exponential down. In the end, 
what you find is it doesn't really matter what form you use. It basically just depends on what the average energy is that you transfer. And you can use it whatever form you want. And again, you're just doing fitting things so, so each fit will be possible. And so the, and, uh, the average, downward, average energy transferred is, is one key thing that the way people think about. We, I find it more productive to think about the average downwards energy transfer, but the, these two are, are, are intimately, are, are analytically related for exponential down models. Uh, the exponential down model, the, the average downwards is approximately alpha. It's not quite because of these integrals aren't infinite, but it effectively is to all intents and purposes. And then you come to some particular system, you want to model, here's an example, ethyl plus O2. Here's a, a, an example of the, of, the, of the ease at which you can fit things. If you've got experimental data, you can choose delta E down, and, and when you do that, you get a very nice reproduction of experimental data. But it's empirical. You do that for enough systems, you start to figure out how the parameters change with si system and what the, with the size and, and how they change with temperature and how they change with collider. But it's got to have a, a lot of data to do it. There's a lot, there is quite a bit of data at 300 Kelvin. The amount of data at 2,000 Kelvin is pretty limited. We want to do things at combustion temperature. We don't really have data. And so that drives us on to trying to do more things. I think I'll stop at, at, at this point for now. And we'll start up again.